I have felt from the Lord um, to teach this, this particular course in the manner that I have uh, in, because, because we have other teachings, even courses taught by me on the tabernacle. It has all of the details of all of the little, you know, the furniture within there and all of those things. <clears throat> and I felt like the Lord really wanted to approach this in terms of the house of God. And so we have, <clears throat> and um, from our last couple of times together, <clears throat> We were in John 14, and I very hurriedly went through that because I felt like that um, most of you got the gist of what I was talking about, and I did it also so I could get to this last class because, um, even though my wife doesn't know this, I'm thinking next semester about teaching on 1 Corinthians, and I think this will be a, uh, a leap. Uh, this will be a bridge. This will help us to get there. <clears throat> so, um, what I'm going to do though is what I've had to do the last couple of times and that is read a little bit so I can uh, <clears throat> make sure that we, we get done here. <clears throat> this, uh, what I'm about to read is um, going to be that bridge from all of the Old Testament teachings about the house of God and the temple of God. Um, and it's going to bridge itself to John 14 and John, really, and Jesus, uh, where Jesus has been talking about himself being the tabernacle, but the coming of the temple. That's what he's been taught. He, he, you know, eventually started moving towards that because that's the goal. The goal never was just Jesus incarnate. The goal was Christ in us better than Jesus incarnate. Um, and in this class, the bridge will go from Jesus <clears throat> incarnate and talking about <clears throat> the, um, uh, the New Testament temple, the real temple, the actual temple that God had in mind, to uh, addressing and dealing with that temple. I mean, past Jesus talking about it in the Gospels, I want to I wanna end with us seeing the temple as God sees it <clears throat> and seeing the manner in which this thing is supposed to be seen. So this is going to, what I'm going to read is going to be that bridge, and you'll hear me make the walk across this bridge from the old to the Gospels to, to uh, the present. <clears throat> Under David, God had allowed his son, Solomon, to build the first temple. Many years later, during the time of the last few kings of Israel, the temple was destroyed by the hands of foreigners. <clears throat> and this is important. By the hands of foreigners. These stories and their time periods depict the historical progression of the house of God, right? Remember my big chart, and at the top, that I, when I handed it out, the top said the historical progression, and we literally gave the history of the house of God in the Old Testament. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so these stories depict the house of God, but as we have seen in other sections of this study, also depict the spiritual progression, and in this case, digression of the house of God. Digression meaning <clears throat> the captivity when the house of God was cast down. <clears throat> and um, so if you remember from previous studies, the historical accounts of the house of God were really only shadows that were pointing to a greater reality to come. That reality arrived when Jesus rose from the dead and we were raised up as his temple and his habitation. Now remember, you know, anything you read about the glory of Solomon's temple is pitiful compared to to the way the Lord sees us as his habitation when we let him live in us. Now, this is the, we're talking about the real temple, not the people who call themselves the temple of God, but don't become a habitation for him. They're too busy living for him in there. Like, remember the Song of Solomon, and he came to his house, and she was too busy living in it to let him come in. 
And so, um, uh, so, it, and so all of those things, the historical is only pointing to the reality to come. That reality arrived when Jesus rose from the dead and we were raised up as his temple in habitation. So it is in the New Testament church <clears throat> where we will find the true meaning of the house of God. And in it <clears throat> is, it, is the New Testament, um, in it, me, let's see, let me make sure I got this. We will find the true meaning of what it means to build a house of God and to tear it down as represented by the Babylonian destruction of the temple. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so what, what really did I say other than maybe what you haven't heard to this point? I said <clears throat> that all of this relates now to us because we are the real thing. And therefore, the building up of the temple by Solomon, by Ezra, Nehemiah, the building up of the house of God <clears throat> is not found in the historical account. It's found in how we relate. And the tearing down of it also is the true meaning of all that it was pictured and all of the horrendous things that happened aren't near as horrendous to the Lord as the tearing down of the temple in the true New Testament. <clears throat> all right, so um, my subtitle here is Divisions and the Temple. <clears throat> For Paul, being God's temple is to be the habitation of Christ crucified. Paul concludes that the same self-giving one who loved me and gave himself for me now lived inside of the apostle. Galatians 2.20. You see, that was, that was the eye-opener in Galatians 2.20, not as we suppose, but that he saw that the one who loved him and gave himself, the one who loves by giving himself for Paul, now lives in Paul, and he, Paul is now dead. And so his total conclusion of Christ now is based on this Christ crucified who lives in him, who, he, who the highest pinnacle of example is the cross. <clears throat> in fact, Paul did not see this as an individual thing, but that we all are now the true temple of God and Christ crucified was the God that inhabits us. Okay, and the, and the description of the God who inhabits us is he loves by giving himself. Okay? And this is the great testimony of Galatians 2.20. Not just that Christ lives in us, not just that Christ, because we can, we can define that Christ in any way we want to and act any way we want unless we recognize, as Paul did, that the one who lives in him loves by giving himself for others. <clears throat> so, um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> His conclusion of this belief was that however we related to one another as the temple of God was either as Babylonians who tear down the temple or as those of Ezra and Nehemiah who build up the temple. <clears throat> Since in the Old Testament it was God who initiated the building of the temple and not Solomon or Ezra, Paul concludes that the initiation of a spirit towards building up the church is the result of Christ crucified who loved us and died to bring us together as his temple. That that's, that's how it's, you know, no man can, this is exactly what Nisi and I were talking about just before we started. No man can take the credit for that. Um, don't worship me, you know. Worship the one who initiates by loving and giving himself. It's Christ in me, but it's Christ crucified in me. Is that, is that, does this make sense so far? <clears throat> All right. So, um, 
Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, any act of building up the church he sees as Christ crucified, and any act of division he sees as foreigners who come to destroy and plunder the temple of God. Now, that may not mean much to us unless you've been spending any time in, let's say, Jeremiah. Or, you know, and if you've been spending any time there, you realize this is incredibly horrendous because whatever he's ta talking about in Jeremiah is only a shadow of coming against the true temple. And he sees... He sees those who tear down the temple as Babylonians. <clears throat> All right. So, this approach can be seen in many places in the New Testament where when the subject of division or idols is presented in relation to the body of Christ, Paul immediately begins to use the terminology for the church as that of the temple of God. And this is how we're going to spend our last... Uh, Two classes, finding out how in the New Testament, when Paul, and we're not going to deal so much with the thing of idols, <clears throat> because that's not our subject, is it? Our subject is the temple of God. And, and when Paul sees divisions, he starts talking about us as the temple because he sees it the way God sees it. He sees the action of division as plunderers, as foreigners who do not have the spirit of the temple and are not inhabited by, the, by Christ crucified, the one who loves by giving himself. They are something foreign to the temple of God. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, for example, when addressing the subject of idols and participation in meals offered to them, Paul does not present it as a moral stand on which not to do so, which you would think he would, wouldn't you? But in relationship to our being the temple of God, and we should have no agreement with such things. <laughs> that's, if you want the scripture reference, that's 2 Corinthians 6.16. 6, In fact, let's just turn there. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 6. Um, there is a lot of dealing with the Corinthians in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And so if, I, if next semester I end up teaching 1 Corinthians, then this is a jumping off point uh, for us. In fact, you know what? Keep your place there. But let me also take us over, you know, and I'm just guessing here, but I think it is 1 Corinthians 6 also. So we're, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians 6. You're going to stay there. In verse uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God and are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in truth and in your spirit is not found in the original um, uh, text. And then back to 2 Corinthians and um, and in verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Anybody ever heard this scripture used in relationship to who you marry? It's got absolutely nothing to do with the subject of who you marry. And in fact, the very people who are telling you don't marry that person might be having concord with, never mind. <clears throat> um, verse 15, and what concord hath Christ with Bel Belial, or what? Part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. For you are the temple of the living God. All right. 
So uh, that's just a little introduction to let you search it out on your own. But you will find, and this is just important if you catch this, and, it, and I hadn't caught it before uh, the last couple of years on this search that I've been on, that uh, specifically the way Paul is approaching this subject and these subjects is that he has, um, he has concluded that the Old Testament was there for examples and shadows of the true. Now we all say that, don't we? <laughs> but but what that means is, you know, what that means to us is that we can learn from that. But in truth, ultimately, you can't learn from that. You can't learn from a shadow who you are. You know, not really. You can, in a very limited way, you can get an idea if there was you know, a planet with no mirrors and no reflections and nothing but a shadow, then you'd have a better idea. But there are those kind of things. But, but Paul had a completely different mindset. I believe he had a, a, true, a true Jewish mindset. And he saw that all of those things were not the important thing to God, that God raised those things up. They weren't the important thing because God raised those things up to point to the true that was going to come. And so he sees all of that only in light of the true temple, which we are. And he doesn't, he doesn't take any credence to those things other than as they point this direction. And from those shadows, though, he gets an idea of how God feels about certain things. Can you sort of see that? Instead of, instead of we going, well, you know, God just doesn't like division. You know what I mean? And then we allow it and we join in. and we, You understand what I mean? Yeah, I, mean I mean, just being honest. But, but if we ever saw it like Jeremiah saw it, if we ever saw like God communicated it to and through Jeremiah about the destruction of the temple, then it would have a completely different effect on us. But we read, well, you're the temple of God. And what that basically means to most Christians is, is that Jesus somehow lives in me. I mean, it really doesn't have anything to do with the temple. You know, I mean, not really. You know, it's like, well... You know, I shouldn't, you know, uh, drop acid because my body is the temple of God. You see, you see that. So basically the most that teaching can give you is to not put hazardous materials <laughs> into your body. <clears throat> All right. So... Uh, <clears throat> So, now, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to begin this thing where we can start seeing Paul's approach and comprehending his words or the scriptures in light of the truth as the fulfillment, the church being the fulfillment of the temple of God. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse uh, 12 and 13. <clears throat> now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I of Apollos, or I of Cephas. And if you want to know who Cephas is, that's just another name for Peter. Or I of Christ is, and the next part of it just is Christ divided. <clears throat> All right. So this division is taking form by what present situation? Anybody? I mean, it says it, but you tell me back again. 
Well, I'll read it again. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I of Apollos, or I of Peter, or I of Christ. What is the point of division here? <laughs> Let's start over here, yes? There you go. There's a division in the body pertaining to others, such as Paul or Peter, and people are separating only to certain ones. Okay. Now, that's the specific issue for which he wrote this letter. There are others that he will deal with, but he'll deal with all of those things in light of, and here's the good news. Next semester I'll be teaching this book. But he'll, he'll, he'll approach every one of those in light of a, a certain reality of not dividing the temple. Because he doesn't see it as people dividing from one another. He sees it as Babylonians attacking the temple of God, okay? <clears throat> All right. So uh, that topic of division in the body carries right through the chapters under chapter 3. So let's go over to chapter 3. Now I'm skipping other references to this, but, but this is good. Chapter 3 and verse, uh, let's start at verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas, this is uh, 3 verse 3, sorry. <clears throat> for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Okay, so um, let me not jump too fast ahead. All right, so what we're seeing is division coming up. And Paul is having to deal with this as a man of God, as a minister. And he cannot afford to deal with it as just somebody seeing problems among people. He cannot afford to do that because God doesn't. He cannot just approach this as a minor issue if God doesn't. He, if, if God sees this as the beginning foray of the Babylonian captivity, And you remember that captivity didn't, ju didn't just happen with, you know, foreigners coming, dividing things up, and then leaving, and it's, you know, then everybody's in captivity. No, there was a long process and several carryings away to bring that about. And it just grew and grew and grew until it was done. Until what was done? The temple no longer lit existed. It was divided. It was broken down. Okay? And they were living in a foreign land without it. All right. So Paul is going to spend an incredible amount of time in this book dealing with different issues, different issues, but always, always the same answer. <clears throat> we're not going to fully get into all of that right now. But, um, <clears throat> all right, so we have him addressing this clearly from, verse, from chapter 1 all the way now to verse 3. We're still bringing up the same issue. So we must agree that whatever is said from, verse, from chapter 1 all the way to verse 3, he's still got this on his mind and that he's probably speaking about these things. You, you sort of agree with that? And just to make sure that you know, we will shortly get to scriptures beyond this. And they're still talking about it, okay? 
So if you can't logically follow that, I'm going to show you that absolutely Paul doesn't give it up because that's what he's talking about, regardless of what subjects we think he's changed along the way. All right. So um, how would we know what Paul is going to talk about next? How would we know that? I mean, how can we conceive of that? The only way that we can conceive ultimately where he's going to end up is that we have to understand his view of division, that it is like the Babylonian captivity, and therefore it is an assault on the temple of God. So that's, it must be where he ends up. You see what I'm saying? All right. So we, we finished off with verse uh, 4. And um, um, well, even 4 and 5 are mentioning different people. But let's drop all the way down to verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's cultivated field. Ye are God's building. All right. Now, come on. Just all it takes is a few seconds to think about it. There's only one building God's ever really claimed. And that's what? The temple. It's the only building he's ever really claimed. Now, in case you're scratching your head and doing what you did on this, this last thing I said, wondering if this is where it's going to lead, he will literally say it here shortly. But you... But it's, it's important that I point out to you before he just blatantly says it, that you be able to um, identify the, the mind of the Lord and how it runs and how it runs through Paul. That that is where it must go because he sees divisions in light of either building up or tearing down, either being true committed people of God or foreigners, okay? So, now he's talked about just, you know, the, in this same verse he says, you know, you're God's cultivated field, you're God's, you know, but then he immediately stops with that line. And he goes, okay, and now he's going to just spend a lot of time talking about this other approach because it is the, the correct approach. You are God's building. <clears throat> um, so, uh, let's see. Let's drop down to verse 16. <clears throat> know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. All right. Now, he's talking about what you build on to this temple and stuff like that. And he's described himself, by the way, before we say too much there, look at verse 10 right after verse 9 about you are the building of God, meaning you're the temple. According to the grace of God, which is given me as a wise master builder, Paul sees himself as a temple builder. That's what he sees himself as. He sees himself as a temple builder. He calls himself a wise master builder. Um, and I'm sure it's here in my notes somewhere. But you do realize that all through the New Testament that word is used, but it, it's hidden in another word. It's the word edify or edified or edifying. Every one of those words, the actual Greek meaning is to build up. Okay? So anytime you see it, look real closely because it probably has something to do with being temple builders. See? Coming back out of captivity and let's build this thing. Or being part of the group under David with working with Solomon to build this temple side by side and you get you you should read the stories and you should you should you should look past the history into the reality when you know when they're making the bricks there's there's you know mention of that in the rock quarries and they're cutting the stones there each one individually and fitting them together before they bring it all together will all be knit together and brought together. There's all this reality that's going on to be a temple builder. And in Solomon's day, 
it was the height of the glory of Israel. And the scriptures declare that. It was the most blessed, the most prosperous, because just about everybody joined in on building this temple. It was, it was the most glorious thing that they'd ever pulled together to do. In Ezra's time, you know, they're coming back they're dealing with, with stones that had already experienced division. Burnt, burnt stones, that's what it describes them as, burnt stones. They'd already experienced it, but they came back. They came back to those stones and they came back to the concept of those stones not being stones, but seeing them as a temple a habitation of God through the Spirit, and seeing their part of which Ezra and Nehemiah was only a shadow. I mean, have you ever read any of those books and said, man, I wish I'd have been there? You know, I mean, you ever, you know. Well, guess what? That was just shadows. You are there. You're more there than they are there. You know, they desire to look into the things that you see or do you see but nonetheless <laughs> all right <clears throat> so Paul's dealing with this division situation and he says you know you're God's building you're the temple and then he just blatantly says, know you not that you are the temple of God? Don't you? See, he didn't, he didn't say, don't you know that God hates division? Or don't you know that um, <clears throat> that's really against the word? I mean, we should love one another and you're causing division? Don't you know that's bad? Well, folks, any way that you word that outside of being Babylonians and foreigners come to defile and plunder the temple will never communicate God's view that today, folks, today is the day of Ezra. Today is the day of Solomon. Are you in the day? Are you in that day? Are you moving with the Lord? Are you seeing what the Lord sees. <clears throat> All right, so this verse proves assuredly that the building Paul is referring unto is the temple, or we who are his habitation. <clears throat> and of course, you know, by getting people's eyes off of Christ crucified, because Jesus is the one who died to build this temple, see. By getting our eyes off of Christ crucified, we may actually be above those who had their eyes on Apollos uh, and Peter and Paul. We may have our eyes on Christ, but Paul wasn't satisfied with that, and he treated people who called it Christ exactly the same as others. He didn't say, why don't you all have your eyes on Christ? He treated it as if they were wrong because you he says this, can, is Christ divided? And you're divided to be with Christ against the rest of the temple. You're dividing the temple. You are a destroyer. You are one who has come to tear down God's holy habitation. I mean, that's, you know, it's the only conclusion you can come to when you actually begin to see these things in light of the fulfillment of everything that God had in mind. And it's not just seeing it in light of the fulfillment. You see that, if nothing else, Paul saw it in light of the fulfillment. And when he gets in that situation, he approaches it solely on the basis of the temple being divided or built up. And what, what category are you in? And he makes that the issue. <clears throat> All right. Um, now between verse 9, where we, are, we uh, are described as the building of God, verse 9, and then verse 16, where that building is described to us as uh, 
as us and called the temple are verses of much importance. In these verses, Paul identifies himself as a master builder. In fact, all those verses are concern, concerning building the temple, which is Jesus' body. <clears throat> um, remember that these thoughts are being interjected in the midst of a conversation concerning divisions among God's people. To, prove, to further prove that the concept of building the temple is tied to the divisions we pointed out in the previous chapters leading up to this one, note the closing verses of chapter 3. All right, so let's, you know, let's go to the last, uh, well, verse 21. <clears throat> Therefore, let no man glory in men. For, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. So in verse 22, he's bringing up this same specific division, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or, and he goes even beyond that. And he makes you to know that... <clears throat> In chapter 3, in between um, all of this of chapter 3 where he begins saying, you know, I wanted to feed you with, with meat, but you couldn't take it, and are you not carnal? For if you say you're of this one or that one, are you not carnal? And he goes right on down, and then he gets talking about the building of God, and then he describes it as us and says, you're the temple. And anything and everything that he says about what you build on this thing all has to do still with this same subject in light of division. In light of divisions. And he sees it as either building the temple or, or tearing it down. He sees it as defiling the temple or, as it were, filling the temple. You, you know what I'm saying. With Christ crucified. Him being the life. And that being the thing. And therefore, he says, don't you, don't you understand that all of this is yours because you're one with it? But just before he says that, um, he says this, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. That's what he says just before he closes out that chapter saying, <clears throat> these, di these divisions shouldn't be happening because they are setting you on ground that is it's saying that you are of a culture of the Babylonians. You are of another country. You are foreign to the self-giving life of Christ crucified who loves by giving himself so that we could come into existence. And, he said, and, and basically he would say, don't you know that this same one lives in us? Is Christ divided? see that. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> so by quoting those last few verses in chapter 3, thus it proves that Paul's presentation of us being the temple and Paul being a master builder has to do with the visions that were then taking place. So how is building the temple tied to divisions among believers? Remember that the words edify, edification, edified, and, and any other derivative of it is best translated building up. So when Paul calls himself a master builder, he is saying that his work is one of uniting and joining living stones together. And you know where I got the phrase living stones, Paul, uh, Peter. You know, that's what he calls us. <clears throat> but... God never meant to call us living stones apart from the temple. You know, I mean, for us, a living stone could be any shaped rock. And somehow he's calling me a rock or, you know, because I'm saved or something. No, he's calling you 
first of all, he didn't use the word rock. He used the stone. And, you know, um, most buildings, they have stone masons, not rock masons. And I'm not really splitting the hairs here. That's because they carve those things. They're not just rocks. Now, you can build a rock wall because you're just throwing any shape together and, you know, trying to fit it together or using concrete. But you don't do that with a house or something like that. They are, and you, some of you have seen me draw this, but I just feel it would help some that have not seen this. <clears throat> There's a difference between any shaped rocks that are gathered together and stones that are built together. All right, the rocks, or if you don't see yourself as a um, as a living stone for one purpose, you'll see yourself as an individual rock, and the gathering together in services or whatever will just be a bunch of rocks coming together. And you'll just throw them all in a pile. And you'll go, praise God, we are gathered here to the Lord. Okay. He doesn't want you to gather together like that. No, he doesn't. He wants you to be joined together as a habitation of God. He don't want you to gather as if Jesus is, you know, like sitting on top of the pile up here or something. You know, we're gathered to you and, I, you know, and, you know, and, and we'll leave you very soon after an hour or two. You know what I mean? But we, we're at least gathered to you. There is no gathering unless it is coming together to become a habitation of God so that, so that each one of us, comes to the measure of the stature of the f- being full of Christ. So that you don't gather just to teach stones or rocks that you're saved. I mean, does that make sense? You don't. You gather to bring each one to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You gather together so that you can be built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And it says that, you know, let's, let's just keep your place here because we're not done. But just so we can see that scripture, Ephesians uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 21 and 22. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. All right. So we are supposed to be being built together for a habitation of God. We're not just gathering to celebrate Christianity. Okay? I mean, there's a big difference. Yes. I think another point that brings out the building is that this is growing. Amen. Amen. And it says we're growing together into a temple of the Lord. We're growing into being the temple because an individual rock could never be the temple in the truest sense of that. Yes. 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 Yes.
Well, and I believe there's a, you know, I didn't go into a whole lot of that, but I, this, the New Testament does talk about our bodies being, calling it a tabernacle, okay? But all that tabernacle is like these stones that become, these rocks that become stones that became built together to be a temple of God, ultimately, okay? Ultimately, that's the goal. But anyway, there's a lot of technical things in that, and I didn't, that's one reason why I didn't get there, because I didn't want to take a bunch of time to try to explain through all of that. <clears throat> but so, you know, and the example that the Lord gave me years ago was if you have a serpent, okay, if you have a snake, give him a little tongue there, and he comes to this gathering, then once he gets there, he finds all these little openings that he can get in and get between people and do all sorts of stuff, right? He can get all mixed up into that stuff. Why? Because number one, we're not being built together. Number two, we're not being a habitation. And there's two different things. One is built. We're being built together with a strict purpose of dedicated hearts that we not just me or a few, we together will become that habitation more and more and more, but also that we become a habitation of God, Christ crucified, so that we will be self-giving in this way so that, what, so that the enemy can't do this. And how does that happen? We are being knit together. See all this knitting? Well, this knitting here is is more than, you know, a knitting needle. We're knit together in love. Well, Galatians 2.20 says, who loved me by giving himself for me. We're knit together because we love by giving ourselves for one another. So that serpent comes over here and he can't find any openings because there's, there's a rock wall. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference? It's huge. It's a huge difference. And the other example that the Lord gave me years ago was that if you had a big old rock pile here, you know, you got all these rocks, and somebody walked along one day, if we had a big pile of rocks sitting out there, and they were nice rocks and everything, somebody walked along and go, oh, I like that, and they picked one up. Nobody around here would know that they got one unless you saw it. You know what I mean? But if somebody comes and pulls one out of your wall, you're going to know it. <laughs> Amen? You're going to know it. Why? Because they are part of us. But you can have a bunch of people that gather together regularly and somebody disappear. You don't notice it for weeks, maybe months. <laughs> Whatever happened to old you know what I'm saying? Wow, it just occurred to me. I haven't seen old so-and-so in a long time. I wonder what happened to them. They weren't built. And, and, you know, you might feel bad. You might go, oh, my God, I feel so bad. They've been gone for six months, half a year, and I never even noticed what kind of Christian am I. <laughs> I'm horrible. Oh, get off it. That ain't what it's about. The, you, you, of course you wouldn't notice it if you had a pile of rocks and somebody stole it. But I guarantee you would notice and you would care if somebody pulled one of those bricks out of the wall because they're built together. And you miss them. And you notice. Why? Because ultimately, folks, the goal is not to be so compassionate and so sensitive that we notice everything and that every little, you know, that's not the goal. The goal is to become exactly what God wants us to become. And in becoming that, what is required will show up then. Do you, do you understand? I'm applying that to this right here, that there are certain things that will show up. There are certain things of noticing. There are certain things of compassion. There are certain things. They will automatically be there when the setting is right. But the church is trying to teach, you know, the, the, you know let's say the preacher's coming over here and, you know, somebody's been gone for six months. Will anybody visit him? And half the people are sitting there going, I didn't even notice they were gone. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and the preacher's going, well, my God, the Bible says you're supposed to, you know, do this and visit the poor and all this stuff. And you don't even notice when one of the members of the family is gone. You know what I'm saying? I mean, rant and rave and beat the fool out of you. And you can sit there and take it and go, oh, my God, you, I should have. Or you can understand in that setting, you'll never do it properly because it's not, they're not built in. This doesn't say gather. It says be built together. And in this setting over here where it is built together, you will notice and all of the things that are supposed to come up will come up. The environment is conducive to the one who inhabits it. But folks, Jesus don't, doesn't live in a rock pile. Rats do. Snakes do, <laughs> roaches do, 40-leggers, centipedes, all sorts of scurvy little things live in rock piles. Okay. But they don't live on the inside of this setup. Maybe they can get on the inside of the house or something, but they don't live in here. And I'll tell you what, once they get inside, their chances of dying are a lot better than living in a rock pile. I don't want to just carry on too much on that. But, but you can, from this, you can begin to see that there are situations, and I'll just say it like this. There are situations that you are probably ignorant of why you're not responding certain ways because certain conditions are not there or why in the past you haven't responded certain ways because certain conditions, there wasn't a certain setting that God set up but we assumed that just because we were gathering and praying and seeking God that I should have had all of that. No. If you're not seeking to be a habitation of Christ crucified, you're going to have none of that compassion to die for or even notice. You know? You know, our spirit apart from Christ is let them die. And they deserve it. Well, I'm, I'm just personally thankful Jesus didn't take that approach. Because I didn't deserve anything from the Lord. But see, why would we be content to have him be that way, but us not be that way? Because we say he's the son of God. Folks, you are the temple of the son of God. Okay, and I'm not trying to rebuke or anything like that. I'm just, you know, in fact, you know, I have pretty much, and I keep saying different things like this, but I've pretty much come to the conclusion that every time I share, God's dealing with me. And that, and that, and that this is about me conforming to the image of his son. And not only that, but I have come to the conclusion that the only one you should expect to ever live up to any of this is me. And I do not expect you to live up to any of this unless you see the Lord and, you know, are changed from glory to glory. You know, that's between you and God. Therefore, anything about laying down your life or suffering loss for others I'm really just telling you my story and my expectations of myself, not yours. Okay? Um, and I could go on and on about that, but there are some real things <clears throat> that have happened in me. For example, we've had people leave, and they, were, they griped about the preaching of the Lamb. Well, and the whole time they've been gone, they've never had to suffer as the Lamb. You understand what I mean? I mean, they've never, but I have. So I wasn't talking to them, was I? <laughs> I mean, ultimately, if somebody today or tomorrow or next year goes away and says, well, I don't like that, well, it wasn't for you. It was for me. <laughs> and I will live this after you go away, and not that anybody's, you know, I don't know. I think everybody's good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but most of you 
are pretty good. <laughs> You know, I tease Mike, but I love the heck out of him. I love him. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, how much time? Are we? Oh, we probably need to stop because as far as the clock, we're actually already over. So, we're going to stop and take, take a break, and we'll come back in just a little bit. <laughs>